How are you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji, host of Tear Talk, and Trump has brought up the discussion of criminal justice reform. So now it's bipartisan. Now we have both sides, the left and the right. But what does that mean for us as frontline staff? I mean, the word has to get out there that there is no rehabilitation without safety and security. So now, if they're going to start discussing criminal justice reform, it's now our chance to discuss our needs. Because rehabilitation behind the wall does not happen unless there's measures put in that can keep the facility safe so staff can focus on rehabilitation. So stand by for our sponsors, and I got a little opinion on what needs to be done if we're to complete this picture of criminal justice reform. And guys, if you like the content, please tear talk, like, subscribe, interact, engage to this channel. And when you hit subscribe, hit that bell. Because when you hit subscribe and you hit that bell, it's going to notify you of every video I post up. All right, guys, stand by for our sponsors. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University. Learn from the leader. Being a corrections officer takes its toll on even the strongest individuals. The constant need to perform at the highest level, putting your life at risk in a hostile environment, and the mental scarring of traumatic experiences. 31% of corrections officers show symptoms of PTSD, and 66% of people with PTSD also suffer with a substance abuse problem. The Transformations First Responders Program is specially designed to help veterans and officers heal from the grips of addiction and PTSD in a comfortable, supportive, and serene setting. You are not alone. If you have questions about the services we offer, give us a call at 866-762-8454 to get more information on this affordable and life-changing program. All right, so now we got criminal justice reform being presented by both sides, the right and the left. Now, again, I, I don't play sides. I don't play left or right. I care about the field. What's best for the field? And what concerns me about the extreme right is they don't like unions. And again, you know, if unions are doing the right thing, people do need a collective voice. And they love that privatization. So I always question every attempt that they try to do to move forward. And obviously, the ultra left seems to be one-sided with their changes. They seem to try to only help out the inmate population and kind of eliminate the people that can facilitate whatever's needed. Not even asking for their opinion or how things can make it work. And they kind of don't, don't realize, but they're making the environment less safe for us to work there. So basically, technically, the people that work the front line are usually eliminated in any attempt for criminal justice reform. So what we need to do is we need to remind the people, because if ever we're going to make an effort now for us, for the changes that we feel need to be implemented so we can go ahead and make it safe for rehabilitation to occur. Because whoever's listening, you got to realize something. There is going to be no rehabilitation unless the environment's conducive to that. So in order to rehabilitate, we have to put a balance in, which means that we also have to keep the facility safe and secured. So we have to have ways to make sure that we're able to do that as frontline staff. You give us the options to keep the environment safe, and then we can promote the rehabilitation. But again, where money has to be put into play is with staff. Right now, the correctional system is bleeding from the inside out. From the inside out. I mean, look at the horrors that happened in just 2017 alone. Riots, death, the murder of staff. And then having, what were the concerns? Well, the concerns were these concerns, and these concerns still have not been met. So we can't move forward with any changes until we affect the changes that need to go when it comes to our safety, our security. So again, got to get that proper staffing. We don't have it. We don't have the proper staffing, which means that we got to get incentives. We got to invite the right people for the job. And we also have to keep people with experience. We're not doing that. Proper equipment. 
We also have facilities that are in play that weren't meant for rehabilitation. They are older facilities. So we have to kind of put money back into those facilities or create new ones. But either way, we have to make changes first that help staff facilitate what needs to get done. And part of those changes are going to be punitive. Inmates have to be aware that these programs cannot be taken advantage of. Because you got to realize something, guys. Inmates, they play games. And sometimes they take things just to take them. Doesn't mean they're learning anything from them. Or because there's another motive behind it. A motive that could be to manipulate the system. So we need to make sure that we have a good filtering process that allows staff to make sure that they have those who want to change. Because remember, guys, there is no rehabilitation unless the inmate wants to be rehabilitated. And some of the changes that are trying to be implemented, they're implemented on the fact that we believe 100% of inmates want to be rehabilitated. Now, now I'm going to tell you, I know for a fact that's not 100% accurate. You know, there were one point there was changes about making sure that every inmate that goes to a correctional facility, if they don't have their GED or, or some form of a high school diploma, that you're to force that on them. That didn't work. Because you got some older individuals that are set in their ways. So they didn't want no high school diploma, no GED. So again, that's just an example, but you can't force people to change. Because in the effort to force them, you're kind of missing out on the others who are ready to change. And that goes back into the environment. You know, custody has to have the means to keep that environment conducive to rehabilitation. Which means that, that if inmates act up during that program, what can they do to make sure that that individual doesn't act up again? Especially during that programming. What's, what, what can they do to make sure if there's a threat in that environment, how can they eliminate that threat so we're free to focus on rehabilitation? Because you can't rehabilitate if there's a threat in the environment. So we have to put in measures first that allow the environment to rehabilitate. So before we focus on any changes related to rehabilitation, which by the way, has exist, and I'll get to that. We need to focus on making the environment conducive to rehabilitation. And that's where we have to support frontline staff and get their opinion. If these are the things that need to get done, how can we make it safer? How can we get these th things done so you can facilitate what we need? But you cannot do these changes in isolation of the people who are most affected by these changes. Because they're the ones that know the ins and outs. See, policies, when they come out, they're generalized. And everybody's expected to follow these policies that are generalized. It's very hard to do that because in those generalizations, the specifics of the facilities get lost. And not every facility can fit into those wide-scale generalizations. Not every inmate can fit into those wide-scale generalizations. So the thing is, when people believe that we're being resistant to certain things, it's not that we're resistant to certain things, it's just it can't be done. Not at this time. Trump, If you, I know you want to implement the, the criminal justice reform, but before you even touch that, let's go back and look at what's needed so we can facilitate that. Help us. Help us first. We are the conduit. We are the filter. If you do not help us and keep remaining on so like a one-sided bias change, we're not going to get nowhere and we're just going to get frustrated because we're going to be putting our lives at risk. But we're not being heard. We're not part of that positive change that you're trying to create. Because right now the changes and corrections have been so one-sided. And, and the people that work there, the ones that sacrifice themselves every day, the ones that go out into the field to, you know, do what's asked of them, you know, they sign that, that oath to protect the public, they're being forgotten. All they're seeing is one-sided change that's going through them, but they have no 
no say in it. So they're frustrated because it's them that has to put their life on the line to commit to those changes. That's a problem. So again, in order for us to address what needs to be done, we still need to fix us, our work. And what are you going to do for us? Because so far, I haven't seen a lot done for corrections. I mean, I, I saw a recent bill passed for mental health for police officers. Well, what about corrections? Their environment is just as stressful. They could use a good peer-to-peer -peer support. That would be nice. I think peer to peer support is an amazing idea. I love that. But I don't know if corrections is going to get that. That's why we still need that universal law enforcement title. So when there's changes that affect law enforcement, it's not ambiguous to us to see if whether those changes are going to help us, are going to benefit us. And I have a feeling the reason why we don't talk much about corrections, and again, I could be wrong, but I have a feeling why we don't talk much about corrections is because the extreme right kind of wants to push to privatization and the elimination of unions. And that's going to be a problem for us because you're going to try to make corrections a right to work. Let me tell you something. We are public servants. We do what we got to do to protect the public. And we should be treated as the same regard as you would treat any other form of law enforcement. And right now I feel that we're just constantly forgotten. So I'm glad to see that you're at the table now talking about criminal justice reform. I'm glad to see that you're talking about the fact that oh, these inmates are going back into the community. We know. And we have to do what we can for them. I agree. But you're not talking about how we can do it for them. And that's when we would expect you to go back and say, we got to take care of those staff members that work there. We got to make sure we protect them because nothing else is possible until we protect our frontline staff. Those better be coming up in your talks. When you start pushing whatever laws that you want to push, you better start pushing for what can be done for frontline staff because there is going to be no reform unless it gets filtered through frontline staff. And I also want to talk about where the finger gets point. This gets pissed. This this really does piss me off. I worked in the correctional system. I have been. I'm still working uh, for the last 15 years, 16 years. And the reason why I fight for us so much is because I know the work we accomplish. And it's insulting when we continue to get bastardized, and we get bastardized from people that never walked in the system. They never walked, they never worked in the system, they just were just a target. And we get bastardized by advocates and, and, and inmates and inmates' families, but, but no one's ever coming to our side. We, sometimes we can't say anything anyway because the department's got us kind of hushed. So the problem is the people that get their voice are the only voices that are heard, and the public starts to believe that because that's all they're hearing, and that's not their fault. That's not their fault because we don't have a chance to contest it. The work that's happening right now, the, the, the total goal of the agency, is rehabilitation. We know that. That's going on in every state. We know what's required. We know what the end result is. And yes, I know that person's going to be my neighbor one day. And yes, I know 95% are going out to the public one day. That's not new information. Even though people are going to push it like it's new information, that's not new information. That information's always been out there. And that's one of the things that are upsetting. People come off like they're pushing out new things and it's not new things. You're not pioneering anything. The work is being done behind the wall. So whatever you're thinking you're trying to implement and you're telling the public that you're implementing is a new thing, that's not the case, guys. Listen to me. That work has been done. It is being done. The problem right now is transitioning those inmates back to the community. So the people that push for change on the outside are the ones that are locking the doors for those inmates when they get released. It's like, oh, you're yeah, fighting for change, far removed. But then when those inmates come out, we're trying to open up something in your neighborhood. No, no, not my neighborhood. But then we're the ones that are told that we could do things a little bit better. I will guarantee you, if you come behind that wall, you will see a 100% effort 
in the making of someone better than what they were when they came in. The multiple departments that work together as one to ensure that someone that comes in with a wacky mindset, well, they have a chance to take advantage of what's given. And you notice that to change their mindset. And you notice I said take advantage of what's given because you can't force people to change. That's another thing. We can come up with all these programs and spend money on all these programs. But if inmates don't want it, there's nothing we can do. And the incentives, the incentive for taking a program should be internal. It should be, I want to take it because I know I need it. You have a parenting program. You know what? I could be a better father. Let me take that program. Because now if there's any changes that are being made, it's sincere. It's internal. But what happens now is because there's such a rush of numbers and, and getting these numbers out there, you know, making sure that it looks successful, people wind up begging inmates to take programs. So when the inmate does take the program, they feel like they're doing us a favor. Hey, you got to take this program. Got to get my number. You got to take this program. Okay, I'll take it, but I'll take it for you, Gans, just for you. Really? I don't need the program. You're taking it for yourself. But when you focus on the external incentive, if you take this program, we'll take off time on your sentence or we'll, or we'll um, give you extra food, whatever the case may be, the change is not going to be sincere. And the problem is, if you start filling up those seats with individuals who are only changing or taking the rehabilitation aspect of it all because they're looking for that external incentive, we're going to miss out on the individuals who want to take it for the right reasons. Another example. Sometimes we offer programs uh, to inmates that look better when they go up for parole. Now, these inmates have ample time to take these programs. But then when they find out that parole's looking for it, oh my God, I got to get that program, got to do it now. They're not doing it because they want to do it. They're doing it because parole is asking them for it. So now the inmate takes the program, totally for the wrong reasons, but I have limited seating. Parole wants them. So now I got to put this person into this program so it'll look favorable for parole. But I got another inmate who wants it, who may not be coming out anytime soon, but I got to tell them to wait. And he wants it for internal reasons. He wants it because the moment he came in, he dedicated himself to making a change. So there's a whole mess of things that got to happen before we start throwing money into rehabilitation. What we have to do first is make sure that our environment is conducive to rehabilitation. We got to bring talks to the table. Even on a national, national platform. Let's have a great big discussion on what we feel is needed that can help staff facilitate the move for these programs. That's the key. Let's get those discussions out there because I'm going to tell you something, guys. You're going to find a great partnership with us because we know ultimately what the mission is. This telling us right now, we know all this. Don't make it look like it's something new. We know what we need. We know what has to be done. But we're being ignored. And then also on another thing, besides the fact that we're being ignored, you're not giving us the tools, but you're blaming us if it doesn't work out. So you're not giving us the tools, you're ignoring our concerns, but then you blame us when it goes wrong. Where's the teamwork here? Where's the help to help us help them? Don't you understand that anything positive that you want to implement for the inmates has to come through us first? Because we're the ones that are going to facilitate what's needed. We're the ones that are going to help carry that mission out. So we want to be part of that team. And then when we succeed, we succeed. We succeed. This ain't about someone putting their name on the paper and saying that they're responsible. Because listen, you're only making practices better because these practices already exist. So you can't put your name on this. This is a teamwork. We got to start showing we. So we succeed. And if we fail... 
Unfortunately, it happens. We can make bad decisions here. We're trying. We fail. Because it's funny, when it comes to that failure, you're not putting your name on that. Now you'll put our name on it. Fair enough, right? That, that, that's totally unfair. So if we start working together and you get staff involved, they're going to want to help make this work. Because now they're part of it. And now here's the biggest thing about it all. Now they feel that you, now they feel that you care. Because they don't feel that. When they see the changes that are happening, left and right, and none of those changes are anything that's beneficial from their perspective, they become resistant. And all these changes that you want to implement, you can't implement those changes if there's that wall there. So you have to look to see how you can knock down that wall. Saddest thing I remember, guys, was, was watching a special when Oprah Winfrey was doing the... Um, the um, talks on the uh, secured housing units up in California. So there she is talking about her... It was a biased perspective. I don't care what anyone says. Interviewing inmates and inmate advocates. And she was talking about how we got to lessen the specialized housing units, the secure housing units, you know, the, the, the restrictive housing units, the administrative segregation, or unfortunately some people term it solitary confinement. She was pushing, obviously, against that. Of course, we push for it because we live in reality and we know what's needed. We know in order to maintain an environment that's conducive for anything towards rehabilitation, sometimes you got to remove the inmates that don't want to be rehabilitated, that, that are not looking for help and continue to be disruptive. And you're actually going to see other inmates that will tell you, hey, you got to get this inmate out of here. But look at the timing of when that video was created. It was right after four staff members were killed in North Carolina. Four staff members killed in North Carolina because four inmates tried to plan an escape. It made no national news. There was really not much attention given to it besides us fighting for our own. But look at the timing. That timing was disgusting. And when you need our help to facilitate something, it's also about timing as well. After that occurred, we're frustrated. We're looking to be protected. And then from our perspective, something gets released that says, eh, we don't care about you. Maybe you do. We don't know. But the timing was horrible. So we feel at this point that we're not being protected. And then we were talking about, you know what's funny? The riot in Delaware got a lot of attention. When that hero by the name of Stephen Floyd was killed, that got a lot of attention. The one, excuse me, in North Carolina didn't. So one, excuse me, one hero was killed, Delaware, gets a lot of attention. Four heroes killed in North Carolina, doesn't get any attention. So I'm thinking, like, why can't I get any attention for this? Like, why, why does nobody want to address this? But yet they were willing to address the, the riot in Delaware. Well, it's because the perspective. When the riot happened in Delaware, people were minimizing the inmates' role in that riot because they were blaming on limited programming, limited education, limited uh, ways to inmates, for inmates to get what they need. So they were able to kind of try to push off some of the inmates' responsibility in the horrendous act that they committed. But then when reality kicks in in October and four staff members get killed because inmates want to escape, you can't minimize their role in that their level of responsibility. So therefore, it doesn't get the attention that's needed from either side, by the way. I have not seen Trump once talk to any of the family members of any of our fallen correctional officers, of any of our fallen correctional staff members. I have not seen him thank any of our family members for the service that their loved one provided. I see a lot of changes affecting law enforcement, and we don't know if we're part of those changes. When he came into office, we were so hoping for something good to finally come our way. If ever there was a time for something good to finally come our way, he should be speaking at that table right now for us. He should say, guys, we can get that rehabilitation going. We can do what's needed. But here's what we got to do first. 
We got to make those facilities better. We got to take care of staff. We got to make sure we got the right incentive to keep people and to get people. We got to make sure ultimately we take care of that front line. Because without that front line, we can't issue anything. There is no rehabilitation without safety and security. So now, just in this effort here, Trump, you're at the table. Discussions are finally being had about criminal justice reform. So just as aggressive as you were for police and pushing that hard on crime outlook, because, I mean, again, I don't know if you're pushing that for the right reasons or if you're pushing it because you got privatized facilities. I don't know. But whatever the case may be, now you can push for us. Because now, finally, we're in your view. So what can you do for us before you issue any changes? How can you make it safer for us so we can do what is needed? Because corrections has been hit hit hard with one-sided changes. Changes that have put our lives at risk. And we're blamed for the failure of people who create these policies with no sense of our safety and well-being. So now you're at the table. Now you're having these discussions. Will you protect us just the same way as you try to protect the police officers? Will you say that we still need that collective voice? Will you say that you'll stand there and create laws that literally protect us like we never were protected before? Will you start trying to get us recognized as the law enforcement professionals that we are? You're at the table now, uh, Trump. So I'm just curious to see what you do for us. I'm very curious. So again, criminal justice reform. It's a discussion being brought up by both sides. Guys, this is our chance. If ever we were going to look for change, the change for us right now is now. It's right now. And if we don't get that change that's needed, because we know what's needed. We know what's needed. If we don't get that change that's needed, then maybe we should start go back and think about the people that we've put in that office. No one cares about us but us, guys. We're in the middle. Extreme left and extreme right, they forget about us. It's about time we step up and do what's best for us. Collect a voice. And don't forget, guys, we got that conference in, in uh, Las Vegas, Corrections USA, from the 5th to the 7th. If you guys have a chance to attend, attend. And guys, remember, the show is here. Talk this message for you. Like, subscribe to this channel, interact, engage, and hit that bell because you'll get notified every time we do a, um, a video. Love you. Oh!